So in last class, we talked about different forms of functions. We talked about positive linear functions, negative linear functions, curvilinear functions, and no relationship. Um, they could be divided into either monotonic or non-monotonic functions. It's important to note when we use the term monotonic, mono means one tone. It goes in one direction, never changes direction. So you can have what's called the positive linear correlation, negative linear uh, correlation, but there are monotonic functions that um, are not linear. Uh, if you have a line that goes up and then goes straight across but never goes down, that would be um, non-monotonic. Uh, that would be monotonic. So, um, for example, if you had that goes up and then goes across, it's still monotonic. It's not linear, right? Because linear would be going up that way, right? But both of these are still monotonic. Um, Non-monotonic is when it changes direction. So you might be familiar with the bell curve. You might be familiar with uh, something that looks like that. Um, these bottom two are considered. Um, these bottom two are considered non-monotonic. Now, when you do a correlation, the correlation, uh, as I said, it it's put on a coefficient from zero to the absolute value of one, um, so positive or negative one. Now, you also want to assess for error. Uh, the stronger the correlation, the better. That means there's less error. Uh, the weaker the correlation, the more error you have. Now, all of these are considered what's called non-experimental methods. The, the concept of non-experimental methods means that you're not manipulating a variable, right? You're measuring a variable, you're observing a variable, you're correlating a variable, but in all of these cases, you're not manipulating something. So it's very important to understand non-experimental methods means you're not manipulating something. Now, what are some of the problems with a non-experimental method? Uh, well, there are two major ones. You can't determine cause and effect, which is something you can do with an experiment. And then you can't get rid of confounding variables. So uh, we talked about this with Cook and Campbell, uh, the concept of in order for a cause to be a cause, you must have temporal precedence, right? Cause must always precede the effect, but especially in the case of experiments, it's possible that you A could lead to B, B could lead to A, right? For example, it's possible that low self-esteem leads to depression, but it's also possible that depression could lead to low self-esteem. Uh, and then confounding variables, tragedies or trauma, things like that could lead to both low self-esteem and depression. Um, the experimental method requires you to manipulate a variable and control for confounds. So the variable that you manipulate we refer to as the independent variable. The variable you measure we refer to that as the dependent variable. And then getting rid of confounds are two ways which I'm going to talk about. The first is systematic control and then randomization. So when we talk about systematic or experimental control, that means you have to keep everything the same except for your independent variable. The only thing that should differ between the groups is the thing you're manipulating. So if I wanted to do a measure to see if uh, a medication treats depression, right? Um, everything should be the same about the two groups except for the drug that I give to treat depression. Because if, it, if other things fluctuate, then we might say it's due to that other factor. But if, if they're identical, the only thing that could have resulted in this outcome would have been our experimental manipulation. That is what we call experimental or systematic control. But there's one problem. When doing experiments, we're dealing with multiple organisms. 
So whether we're looking at multiple animals or multiple humans, no two people are identical. Even identical twins are not truly identical. So there are going to be differences. So how do you handle those personal differences? Well, randomization. So randomization is the process of neutralizing the effect of outside factors. So you can either do random selection, how you recruit to participants, or you could do random assignment, how you put them into groups. But ideally, there should be no bias in how people are put into groups. So randomization is the way to eliminate uh, those personal characteristics, personal differences that people bring in to the experiment with them. So, uh, as I mentioned, when we talk about an experiment, a basic experiment has one independent variable, one dependent variable. And you may recall in our last lesson that the definition of a variable is anything that can fluctuate, anything that can assume uh, two or more levels or values. Uh, so an independent variable, that's the variable you manipulate. Now, the two conditions within the independent variable are your experimental group and your control group. The experimental group is the group that receives the intervention. So if we're doing a drug study, that's the group that receives the drug. The control group is, it serves as a comparison group. They don't receive the intervention, if that makes sense. Um, now, the dependent variable is the variable that you measure. Uh, it's usually referred to as the effect or the outcome of the manipulation. Um, now, if your experiment had no impact, then both of the conditions might get the same outcome, right? Might, the dependent variable might be the same. But if your experiment was truly effective, then uh, you, we would expect different outcomes. Now, remember how I said for something to be a variable, it must have the capacity to assume two or more levels? Well, that's what I mean on the dependent variable as well. All right, that's just a plotting slide. You'll notice that on the x-axis, if you have an independent variable, you put the independent variable on the x-axis. If you um, don't have an independent variable, then you just put one dependent variable on one, one dependent variable on the other. But when you have uh, an independent variable, the dependent variable goes on the y-axis. Now, these are the three principles of causality, temporal precedence. The cause must always precede the effect. Otherwise, you have the problem of the chicken-egg phenomenon. Uh, co covariation of the cause, that means in the presence of the cause, you get the effect. In the absence of the cause, you don't get the effect. And eliminating confounds, that we said was to neutralize uh, or eliminate any possible alternative explanation. So right now, you're probably saying, hey, an experiment is more powerful than the other methods because you could determine cause and effect. right? If we go back to lecture one, I said, with the four goals of science, observational methods allow you to describe behavior. Correlational methods allow you to describe and predict behavior with an emphasis on predicting behavior. And then an experiment allows you to describe behavior, predict behavior, determine cause and effect, as we talked about, and explain behavior. So by now, you're probably saying, you know, let's just go with experiments all the time. Well, not so fast. Even experimental methods, which are the gold standard of research, have their drawbacks. And here's a list of drawbacks that we're, we're going to go through one by one. Artificiality. So sometimes doing an experiment, uh, you want to control for error, but because it's so contrived, it doesn't reflect the real world. So one of the problems with an experiment is artificiality. So you might not be able to generalize from your experiment to the real world. So for that reason, some people choose to do non-experimental methods. 
Now, you do have another alternative. If you really are committed to doing an experiment, you could also do a field experiment. A field experiment is one where you're still doing an experiment, but you're doing it in the real world. Your manipulation might happen in a park. It might happen um, on campus or whatever it might be, but the manipulation isn't happening in a, uh, a contrived, boring lab. Now, you get better ability to generalize, but one of the problems with that is that um, you have less control over the outcome. So it's a trade-off between internal external validity. Another reason why someone may not do an experiment is there might be ethical problems. So there are sometimes you cannot manipulate a factor. If you're doing a study on drugs and alcohol, you're not going to be able to manipulate that factor. Right? You can't say here, I have enough sober people try this cocaine. You can't do that. Or here, I have enough married people, uh, I'd like you to get a divorce to be part of my experiment. So there are times when it's unethical to do a certain kind of study as an experiment. So we uh, do surveys and we ask them, tell me, were you raised in a family that was married, divorced, separated, this, that, or another? So we ask relational status and then compare group differences. And that's what we call an ex post facto design. Participant variables, we cannot manipulate things like age, gender, ethnicity, marital status. Uh, when I say we cannot manipulate them, it's either impossible or, as the previous slide said, unethical. So I don't care how much Botox a person gets, their chronological age is a chronological age. All right. And, and then we have to think about sometimes we just want to describe behavior. Our goal is just to describe behavior. And some really cool studies came from careful observation, like Piaget's cognitive stage theory. He didn't use an experiment. He used careful observation. So he was able to describe behavior. And if all you want to do is describe behavior, this should be sufficient. Sometimes you want to just predict behavior. Maybe you don't want to know the cause, effect, or explain behavior. Maybe you just want to know uh, whether or not this instrument could predict success as a salesperson. right? So that instrument might be used as a predictor, and a correlation is sufficient. You don't need an experiment. Now, here's the deal. Obviously, an experiment is the most ideal, but... Because of its limitations, we always encourage people to use multiple methods. Because if you do multiple methods and you combine the results and you get similar outcomes, you're going to get a fuller picture than any single approach. Because no single method gives you the full picture. Now, the next part of the lesson is about reliability and validity. I know I'm going fast, but um, I apologize. It, everything is correspondence now. Reliability refers to consistency of scores. Validity refers to accuracy of scores. Now, every single measure has some error. So when you look at anything, whether it's my test, whether it's um, you take an IQ test or a personality test, there's always going to be some error. So every observed score is a combination of your true ability or your true score plus error. Now the reliable measures have very little error. That's the goal is to have most of the outcome due to your true ability and very little due to error. Now um, if you do not have a reliable measure then it's useless. With reliability is a precursor to validity so if you don't get consistent outcomes then it's then your outcomes are useless. Um, what do you do, though? Do you scrap the whole project if you get something that's not reliable? No, you might want to evaluate why the scores are all over the place. And depending on your design, depending on your research, you might you know, better train the observers. You might uh, evaluate how your surveys are Crafted. You might, if you're in neuroscience, think about where you place the electrodes, and it gives you data. Now, 
There are different ways to measure reliability. The first one I introduce you to, which we refer to as a correlation, uh, so the Pearson product moment correlation, um, that goes from zero to one in the positive or negative. For reliability purposes, the, the higher the number, the greater the reliability, right? So ideally you want your reliability measured to be 0.7 or 0.8 depending on which measure you're looking at. Now, reliability refers to consistency of scores. So do I get the same thing over and over and over? So one way to measure that is what we call test-retest reliability. Test-retest reliability, listen to what I'm saying, uh, you give the same people the same test at two or more points in time. Now underline same, same, two. Same people, the same tests at two or more points in time. Now, if a measure is reliable, the scores should be consistent. Remember how I said, it, depending on what measure you're doing, it should be 0.7 or 0.8. In this case, 0.8 is what you're looking for when you do test retest reliability. But what's the problem with giving the same test to the same people two or more points in time? There are two problems. One is that people may remember the questions. And if they remember the questions, they might give the same answer. And maybe it's the same wrong answer, right? So all of a sudden you have reliability, but not because the test is reliable. It's just that they remember it. There's another problem. What if they give different answers? Well, that possibly could be due to many things. It could be due to error, but it could also be due to maturation. We would expect through time people to acquire new skills, learn new things, so it's possible that there might be changes over time that way. Now, so, um, test, retest, reliability, one way to address that. Actually, I don't think I said it. Um, ah, the solution. There it is. Uh, one way to address this uh, artificiality is something called alternate forms reliability. When we say alternate forms reliability, we're giving different versions of the same test to the same people at two or more points in time. Now, because it's different versions, you can't remember the answer. So if you get consistency, you say you have reliability. But nothing can cure the maturation problem. We have another issue. If you're gonna give this, if, if you're gonna give a person a test at two or more points in time, you have to follow them through time and people disappear. People may not want to participate multiple times. They might want to participate once. So we have to have other ways to measure reliability. So one of these ways is what we call internal consistency reliability. And when we talk about internal consistency, we're, we're giving one test at one point in time. And now what we're doing is we're taking that test. One way to do it is called split half reliability. Cut it in half. The first 30 versus the second 30. Odds or evens is even better. Uh, and then you compare, you correlate odds versus evens, and you see if you have similar scores. Chromebacks Alpha is a correlation of each individual item with every other item on the test. Now, if you create a test instrument, you're going to need Chromebacks Alpha. And for, for the alpha of Chromebacks Alpha, you want a 0.7 or higher. So notice, if I go back, uh, when we were talking about test retest reliability, you want a 0.8. When we talk about Chromebox Alpha, you want a 0.7 or higher. Okay. Other ways of measuring reliability is inter-rater reliability. You could have multiple people observe the same thing. This actually happens more frequently than you know. If we were to take sports, for example, inter-rater reliability happens. Uh, an example of this might be diving, where you have multiple judges evaluating diving, or gymnastics or boxing, or mixed martial arts. Now, in the Olympics, they tend to be very, very consistent in their scores. The reliability tends to be pretty good. When we get to mixed martial arts or boxing, it's not as good, is it? You might get a split decision. So 
which one has greater reliability then? Olympic sports. Now, but reliability, you may have heard me say, is a precursor to validity. Reliability is not enough to say you have a meaningful outcome. You have a consistent outcome, but it could be consistently wrong. So we want something to be accurate as well. So that accuracy is how we measure validity. And there are different ways to measure validity. Validity is the truthfulness or accuracy of a measure. There's internal, external, and construct validity. I'm going out of order. Internal validity refers to your ability to say your independent variable cause changes to your dependent variable. External validity is your ability to generalize from your sample to a population. And then construct validity is talking about theoretical constructs. And I did a whole rant on constructs like love and happiness and whatnot. So when it comes to construct validity, most psychological phenomena rely on theoretical constructs. So the first thing you're going to do is examine face validity. Does it look, whatever this test is, does it look like it's measuring what it's supposed to? So if I had a measure, I don't know, studying substance abuse, you would look at the test and ask a person who didn't know what the test was about, what do you think the test is about? And if they could say, oh, this is a measure of drug abuse or substance abuse, it has face validity. Now, face validity in of itself is not enough to say an instrument.